Good afternoon. My name is Erica Mendoza from the class of 2018. As the Brooks Alumni Fellow in the Office of Alumni Relations, I'm excited to kick off today's conversation from the Race in the Workplace web series, Recharge and Refocus, Tips for Sustaining Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Work. Before I hand things over to our moderator and panelist, I have some brief housekeeping notes. During this hour-long conversation, you're welcome to submit questions at any time throughout the conversation using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Many of you have submitted questions ahead of time and we took them into consideration to help us guide our conversation for today. In addition, this webinar will be recorded and will be sent to registrants. I'm thrilled to present our amazing panelists for today's conversation. We'll be joined by our two panelists today, Dr. George Wimberly and Dr. Isaac Teste. Unfortunately, Natalie Sanchez is unable to join us today due to personal reasons, but I'm so delighted to have George and Isaac with here, here with us today. Dr. George Wimberly from the class of 1992 currently serves as a Director of Professional Development and as a Diversity Officer at the American Educational Research Association area. Um, with the focus on diversity, equity, and inclusion, he leads their professional development training as well as developing and managing uh, areas, dissertation, and postdoctoral fellowship programs. Dr. Isaac Teste from the class of 2004 currently serves as a senior manager for diversity, equity, and inclusion at the executive office of the Massachusetts Trial Court. He has served as a diversity practitioner in multiple industries for over a decade and has designed and implemented inaugural diversity strategic plans, reimagined talent acquisition and retention practices, and overhauled organizational diversity training sessions. So without further ado, it is my pleasure to turn things over to my coworker and friend, the Director of Alumni Career Development, Morris Sweeney, class of 2007. Thank you, Erica, and welcome everyone. It's so great to have you here today. I'm thrilled to have the opportunity to talk to George and Isaac. We've had a few prep calls where we've gotten to talk and I can tell you, I have been looking forward to this for a while. So thank you. As we get started, to build off of the introduction that Erica gave, I'd love to know how each of you define diversity, equity, and inclusion so we can level set right from the beginning and help make sure that we're talking about the right things, or not the right things, the same things when we say diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, Isaac, I'll pass it over to you first. Thank you. Uh, and I'd just uh, first like to say, I'm really delighted and happy to, to be here uh, my, my life on the Hill, uh, I, I still believe, has not ended, so uh, I'm glad to continue to find ways to, to be involved, so thank you for uh, asking for me to, to be here today. So uh, the way I like to think about it is, is typically in the context of organizations, and, and so uh, the way we are defining diversity for the Massachusetts Trial Court is understanding that Diversity is really about the unique contributions and perspectives of, of individuals based on a range of uh, dimensions of identity, uh, which include, but are not limited to things like race and gender, your national origin, uh, culture, et cetera, et cetera. Um, when, I, when I think of um, equity, which I think is, is certainly important for us in these conversations to draw some distinction between is that we're looking at treating um, folks fairly and impartially so that they are able to contribute to organization success. And inclusion is really um, about, an, it's, it's an ongoing effort. It's something that never ends. Mm. So it's, it's an ongoing effort to continue to remove those exclusionary barriers and, 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 and structures that, um, that might challenge uh, an individual's ability to contribute to the organizational goals uh, and objectives. That's great. George, what would you add from your perspective? I know you're, you're coming at it from a different industry. Yeah, a slightly different perspective. I, I'm trained as a sociologist, so I like to think of things in a very much the group fashion, sort of that uh, high level macro level of thinking about diversity. And when I think of a uh, way of defining diversity, is that we're in a sense thinking of different people, different groups of people. And, but I think sometimes also being very specific about it. We're talking about diversity, we're talking about racial and ethnic groups. We're, we're talking about different people from different socioeconomic status, different life experiences, um, sort of writ large. 
thinking about that and the different thoughts and perspectives that people can bring because of this diversity. But at the same time, in that same diversity lens, think about there, we have to pay attention to people who have been disenfranchised mm -hmm. in some, some sense, some way. Uh, and that's, that's where really a lot of these different and the conversation is going. How is it we are going to have disenfranchised groups involved? Now I'm gonna sort of switch to the, then the equity part of this is if, you're, if you have different people from different groups, what then is fair because people come from different uh, experiences uh, and having you know, different life experiences, different social structures, different life chances. Mm -hmm. And then the inclusion part, which I think is in a sense the exciting part is that how is it then that we invite people to the table, invite mm -hmm. them to the party <laughs> in that sense and make sure that they are then uh, welcome, included and, and, and given uh, uh, voice where they may have otherwise been voiceless. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. I think that that helps as we dig into the focus of this talk of really figuring out how we can sustain this work. How can we can sustain this inclusion? Really, um, I think that that helps to give us a good grounding. So thank you both. Um, as a as a start, I'd love to learn more about each of your workplaces and your specific role in supporting diversity, equity, and inclusion in those workplaces. Could you talk to me a little bit about what that looks like for you right now? I guess, um, Isaac, I'll pass it to you again. Sure. Um, so, I don't think anybody would really be surprised if I were to say that the justice system is um, really trying to figure uh, figure this out, yep. and so I'm I'm happy to say that you know Massachusetts is the only justice system in the country, the only state justice system that has an office like mine, uh, Office of Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, and Experience. So you know, for those of us who are still in Massachusetts, hey hey, you know, good job. Um, but when I think about the conversations at the trial court is is really grappling with. Um, and I'm going to borrow from uh, last night. We had a, a, a webinar for um, the state of Massachusetts. Anybody could log in. And it was an open forum for people to talk to the chief justices of all the various court departments. And, and one of the things that, that continued to be raised and continue to be discussed is the, the idea of fairness and impartiality and, and how does one's social identity um, impact fairness and impartiality. And one thing that was very clear from the Chief Justice of the Supreme Judicial Court to the Chief Justice of the Trial Court um, down was that our role is that we need to continue to understand how our own experiences and our biases really do influence how we engage with each other and, and those coming in seeking the court services. So when we think about diversity, equity, and inclusion, we're really thinking about how is it that we can continue to pursue fairness and impartiality in ways that we haven't done before? Because we know that current practices, um, unfortunately, continue to yield still disparate outcomes in sentences, disparate outcomes in, in a number of areas. And so the trial court is very much aware of it, and we're working toward uh, being able to close that gap. Right. And it's good to know that Massachusetts is paving the way in such an important, important direction. That's fantastic. George, I know you're joining us from outside of Massachusetts and you're joining yeah. us uh, <laughs> from Maryland. Um, talk to me about, about your workplace and what your role looks like in supporting this work. Well, a lot of things to talk about my day job, as I like to think about it. Sure. And sometimes my day, evening, night job <laughs> and all. <laughs> Uh, at the American Educational Research Association, we're, we're located in Washington, D.C., which is the, the heart of a lot of things. And normally, I'm in, in, my, in our office space, but this pandemic has us uh, uh, working remotely. One of the things is it, and what we do is we study education issues, and that's sort of the issues around school and schooling from um, birth through you know, the, the K-12 years, uh, higher education, how we then people are transitioning into professions and graduate school and careers 
and how, in a sense, then too, where our government, the federal government often is funding different research and foundations are funding research and creating new knowledge that relates to education in that sense. Uh, one of the things is, one of my, my goals are some of the programs that we run is how is it that we're creating science and scientists, specifically in, in thinking about science, science is writ large as well. It's, it's not only the biological and chemical and physical sciences, but it's also the social sciences mm -hmm. and, and, and all as well. And how is it this training that happens for, for scientists beginning again as early as um, the elementary uh, school years uh, and, and, and some things are earlier than that, I uh, to think about it. Um, how is it we are bringing diversity and to, to, to the field. So, and, and not only a diversity in scientists that they've had, that people have been trained in having that, those experiences, some of our, our fellowship programs and things of that nature that are specifically still, it actually, we have a, one that's still a minority dissertation fellowship, for example, something I manage that is, that is, that is geared specifically to racial and ethnic minorities and, and providing some, not only funding, but also some additional supplemental type training around that but really is in what is it we're doing to try to grow the scientists and to grow this new knowledge. Um, and what's the, what the goal is not only of creating these scientists, but just in a sense too, that they're gonna go back into their communities. They're gonna do the, this, they're gonna create, they're gonna do the studies that are in their in, in disenfranchised communities. And this is all gonna make the United States remain competitive in the mm -hmm. scientific fields, because I always say that, you know, this, you, know, um, you may be teaching the, the, the person who's gonna, discover the cure for, for cancer or COVID-19 or what have you. So mm -hmm. that, that's always so important to think about that. That's wonderful, thank you. It's nice to have you, you both speak to it from such different angles um, and yet such the justice system and education are such critical places for change in, in this work. So it, it's really wonderful to have you both here. Um, this question, I'll open it up to whichever one of you wants to answer first. Um, how do you see your personal identity influencing the way that you do this work? Isaac, you mentioned that a big part, I think, for all of us, no matter where we work, is understanding our own biases and working through those. Um, so I, I put it out there to either one of you about how your personal identity is influencing this work and, and maybe the way that you approach it. Well, I guess I'll, I'll start there. Sure. I always like to, to think about, and I can relate this back to something, a Holy Cross panel and things. Um, what's so important for me, even as a, a, a black man, an African-American man in the United States, is that as, as you look at this, what, it, what has been my life experience mm -hmm. in that sense? Um, you know, I, as a sort of post-civil rights child. So a lot of the things in that, you know, we always think of the generation of, we were the, the integrated generation. We wanted the kumbaya moments. We, we you, know, you know, Martin Luther King had the dream and we were, we're trying to live his dream and things. So in that sense of coming at this, we're definitely a very um, optimistic mm -hmm. uh, view and that, that the world can and accept people for differences and, and that, you know, in areas of things around believing in democracy and that, you know, we are in a place this, if it's gonna happen, if, there is going to be diversity, there's equity and inclusion. The United States is the place for it. And our mm -hmm. systems are set up to make this happen that, and, and to improve things for people. Um, I think that that's really my, sort of my own personal view. I think that too, that I, I mentioned Holy Cross, or that's sort of, you know, there are institutions, schools, be it schools, churches, what have you, that in a sense, it plays such a role. And sometimes taking people in a sense by the hand <laughs> and helping to shepherd them through different systems and recognizing that um, some people have differences in, a, I mean, in terms of you know, what your backgrounds are, what your training has been or school experiences have been um, in a sense to um, sort of fill in any gaps mm. that one might have and recognizing those differences. Mm. Yeah. Um, I, I would, I'll take a very personal um, approach and so I, I am uh, blessed to be uh, the child of a biracial couple uh, so uh, my father is an Eritrean immigrant um, my mother uh, 
Um, they both met in New Hampshire. You know, her ancestry is French Canadian. And, and I grew up in a very homogenous community. And I didn't really begin to understand the differences until at some point in, in, in late primary school, maybe somewhere in junior high, where all of a sudden jokes are being attributed to me that I was academically successful because of my mother's blood, but I was athletically inclined because of my father's blood. Mm. And, 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 and those types of comments and engagements um, really helped me to um, kind of go on this journey. Uh, in addition to the fact that, my, you know, when I think of my father, he was the only black person in my community, my home community, mm-hmm. and probably, you know, a three, four, five mile radius. I, I, there were, you know, I used to bike all over the place. I never saw another family that had someone who looked like my father or who looked mm-hmm. like me. And so uh, one of the things that, that was helpful is, is you know, one, my, my parents ensured that they, they, they instilled in me the values and cultures they wanted to, but society was playing a very uh, powerful role in shaping my identity as well. And there was one point at Holy Cross where um, I remember we, we were, there's a, there were heavy debates about affirmative action, very heavy mm-hmm. debates. And I wrote in the, in the paper, as basically saying, you know, there's always this black and white, this, this binary discussion of race. And yet we don't really have a discussion of people like me who uh, are, are not one or the other that fall right in between. And there are few resources and few opportunities for the exploration of that, that experience. And so, um, I founded MIX, which is no longer, I, I last understood it's no longer a student organization, but you know, a place where people can talk about these issues. So wherever I've gone, I found a way to, to create space to engage in those kinds of conversations. And, and that has led to uh, where I am today, which is still being very much engaged in the conversation. And, and part of the thing that keeps me in it is that I continue to learn every single day with every new encounter, So nothing is the same. It's always new and I'm continuing to learn. And so um, I I, I stay in it because it's extremely enriching for me. Well, that is very, thank you for sharing that that personal story. And and it's very encouraging to hear you talking about it feeling rewarding because I know the topic of this talk is where we are trying to focus on sustaining and making sure that we do have time to care for ourselves while we're caring for others and looking to make change in the community. And so when you look at your workplace and the trainings that have been happening and the different initiatives that are under play, in place, um, what are you hearing from colleagues? Is it, are people feeling energized and, and really engaging? Are you, are you sensing any resistance at all? George, I'll pass it on to you this time. This, this is a really interesting question and a point because there's some of the things that we've had that have sort of always been going on. I think about trying to include different people and that conversation comes up in different ways. I think the biggest difference right now is A, it's getting a lot more attention mm-hmm. and, and yep. that, you know, and some things about race and racial experiences, they're not just talked about, they're video recorded <laughs> more than anything. And that's what we're, and that, and there's something like there in terms of the evidence that's there that we, we have um, more evidence than we did in the past about this. Uh, And people are starting to relate to that, that human touch of this. I think at the same time though, we, there's this realizing that um, this isn't going away and that it is systemic and systemic racism, classism, other isms that are in our society are, are just there and they need to be acknowledged. Uh, and I think they are being acknowledged, acknowledged more because of, of this conversation. But then on the flip side, there is, there's also a little bit of fatigue, I think, too, mm-hmm. because I think in terms of um, you know, people are saying that uh, so that racial battle fatigue, that of having to have these conversations and to um, and this keeps coming up, you know, uh, mm-hmm. kind of wanting it to go away or looking to that person of color or that person that they're seen as being, you know, reflecting diversity, wanting their opinion. 
So, so, so there's sort of a, a there's, there's two things going on. So it's great that these things are being talked about, but at the same time, there are challenges. Yeah, I, I think I would um, add, and I, I like George's um, edition of really talking about the fact that you know there, there's data out there, either in the form of video or in the form of text or in the form of what have you. Uh, one of the things for the trial court uh, is that we, we, we are the first state justice system to, to actively publicize our internal data. And so one of the very first things that, that, that it did was, you know, press got a hold of it, um, community uh, agencies and uh, active mem political members of our communities, they took this information. And, and one, we're thankful, but two, we're like, okay, so now that we know where you are and perhaps where you want to be, what the heck are you doing about it? And so uh, one of the things that, that has prompted our, the trial court to do is to really begin to look at what are our internal capacities for talking about these issues? And, and one of the things that's been really great is um, we, uh, last June or last summer, we, we put out a document which was oriented for managers, but it was really intended for managers to become comfortable with being uncomfortable. To, so the idea was people don't wanna talk about it. Race is, is such a, a taboo thing and we are the justice system. So we're supposed to be fair. We can't even be thinking about race. We can't talk about that because then we might be unfair. We might be showing that we have some partiality towards some members and not others. So we just can't talk about it. But what we push back is to say, no, in fact, our mission tells us that we have to. The mission of the trial court says that you must pursue fairness and fair and impartial administration of justice. And talking about racism, sexism, and all of these things are, in fact, very much part of our job. Mm. And so we're really working right now at looking at, one, how do you build the comfort to have these kinds of conversations? How do you bring in people to have these conversations? And then third is how do we sustain it? And that's the toughest part is you, you can have a, uh, uh, an agenda on a, 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 in your meeting and be done with it. Mm. And, and so we're trying to encourage every area of our, of our Massachusetts justice system is to find ways to actively embed these kinds of conversations so that it's not just a, an intellectual exercise, that this is in fact becoming part of our practice so that we are able to pursue fair and impartial administration of justice. Well, and, and that really leads on to something that that I'm particularly interested in because once upon a time, my first job out of Holy Cross, I worked in human resources and I, it was very clear to me right from the beginning, race is a protected class. You don't talk about it, particularly I worked in hiring. So you don't talk about it. And now we see that changing in, you know, as you said, you, <laughs> it's real. It's part of, it's part of our life it would be silly not to talk about. And yet I think there are a lot of people, as you mentioned, just creating that, that comfort. There are a lot of people who still hold that it's a protected class. I'm not supposed to talk about it. I'm not gonna talk about it because I don't wanna be sued. So how have you, how have you made some inroads? Cause it sounds like you have um, to, to helping people understand when and how it's appropriate to talk about race. And like you mentioned, George, when, it's not appropriate to call someone out or create a sense of tokenism and ask specific people to talk about their personal experiences in an inappropriate way. So I, I'd love to hear Isaac, just some of what you're doing with some of these trainings um, to help people get, get more comfortable understanding the difference. So I, I, I always find every opportunity to say, there's no such thing as reverse racism. Racism is, is racism, period. Yeah. Um, so having said that, uh, the, the challenge I think with, with hiring is that traditional means of evaluating candidates, I'll give you an example. Um, when you're hiring for your department and you typically go to this one um, 
uh, conference or you go to this one thing, right? And that's where you get your best candidates from. And part of our role is to say, why do you go there? Mm -hmm. And perhaps, so you're going there for a particular type of person that you're looking for, but what about the people who aren't able to get there? Mm -hmm. So when I used to push back with where um, d academic departments might want to advertise their job postings, I'd, I'd have to argue and say, I'd, I don't think that's the sole place where you find your best candidates. And after some conversation about what they were looking for, they realized you might be right. I, 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 that's just what we've always done traditionally. That's what we have done. Mm -hmm. But some of the best candidates are going to other places. They're going to um, you know, other conferences or other trainings or other spaces where we're not looking at it. And one way that we help people to understand that is if you, if you look at a CV, Oftentimes, it'll, you know, we ask, you know, they'll indicate the things that they participate in, committees or papers they've written or things like that. And that in and of itself, we, it doesn't tell you about race, but it tells you about what they value. It tells you what their interests are. And then every organization who's trying to be a little more inclusive would want to pursue those types of individuals, regardless of race, to really begin to... Um, bring those interests, those skills, that knowledge into the organization. Mm. And so uh, that's allowed for us to kind of think differently about hiring, mm -hmm. uh, you know, for our justices. The, it's, some are elected and appointed by the governor. So those we really, I'm not really speaking to, but I'm, I'm really thinking about those who go through a traditional hiring process. And our HR department is in, in a complete overhaul. They've hired a, a brand new staff. We're really trying to be committed to this. And so we have a whole new talent acquisition team uh, who's really beginning to think differently about what are the traditional means through which we evaluate candidates. And, and so we're, we're really working with them to, to better understand that process. That's great. That's great. It's good to know. Good, again, to see these changes in place. And George, I, yeah, I'd love I'll, to hear. Yeah. Yeah, I'll add to that in a bit. So I think there's just yeah. one thing, a couple of things. One is that organizations or institutions have to have a commitment to diversity, first yep. of all. And that's, and that's something that really needs to be formally expressed. Now it can be part of a, a mission or a strategic plan, but somewhere, I mean, we, we, it has to be acknowledged because of just yep. knowing the society that we're in and the problems that people have, uh, have encountered. But at the same time, is, is, there's that immediate, I, I, I like the idea of, as I was saying, you know, you're going to different uh, conferences and meetings and meeting uh, possible candidates and or into your community. But I will also argue that organizations have a responsibility to, in a sense, to help develop uh, a diverse pool of candidates. So if that is something that's happening either internally within their organization, that, that's someone who's who's going to start with them as a, you know, right out of college or, or high school or something and, and sort of how, what is your commitment to sort of develop this person and to, if they're gonna go into management or to be a leader within your organization. But it also may go back to that same organization reaching into their, their local community into their the K-12 school system, for example, and how is it we are going to develop students early on that they are then later gonna be prepared for these careers. And, 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 it, and it can be beyond sort of the, you know, the occasional job shadow or internship but, but a, an actual commitment that we are trying to, you know, a lot of our communities are, are quite segregated, racially segregated. So there, there's definitely needs there. How is it we can develop? You know, not just the, the top, you know, few students that they're gonna go on and do things, but, you know, we're gonna have a commitment to this, our community. We wanna look forward to the next 20, 25 years. It's the pool is gonna be much more diverse. Mm -hmm. And we're and, and we're we're prepared for that. Uh, I mean, it's, it's sort of like a lot of the, there's a lot of talk sort of uh, around the year 2000, which is you know, thinking about that now. We're talking 21 years ago that by 2020 we're going to all these these goals that we we we, we have for um, society and integration and things. But I think there is really where looking ahead into another mm -hmm. to the next generation. It's not can't just be a snapshot. I think that's the other thing that's key is right now is that this can't just be a moment. Yep. Diversity and equity and inclusion and those topics in, in, in the workplace or in society at all. 
Well, you know, and that that idea of organizational change, really sustained organizational change, um, speaks to a question that, that just came in through the chat. And they are talking about, and I'm paraphrasing here because they, they have a lot of great points, but um, about the fact that you can recruit for diversity, but you also need that inclusive culture to support the people when they come in. And I know sometimes I've experienced, and you're both nodding your heads, that people, it's kind of the chicken or the egg issue, um, but people try to bring in diverse candidates, but they don't actually have systems and a culture that can support um, the kind of change that they're looking really to create. And so um, the question they ask is, how are you transparent with candidates on the culture of the organization um, in order to bring them in, hopefully create the change and, and create sustained change, but knowing that people kind of have to sign up to be maybe one of the first or a trailblazer in that organization. What, what thoughts do you have about, about that question? So I, if I, I, the second question, um, I fully agree. Uh, <laughs> trainings and workshops have a, a very limited value. Um, and so there's value, it's just a limited value. So they're effective in terms of they satisfy requirements. Mm -hmm. They ensure that um, organizational positions have been clearly stated and has been communicated. I think that it's really important to ensure that everyone is presented with the same information and the same expectations. And trainings are um, great tools to be able to do that. But when I think about trainings to undo our own biases or mm -hmm. our own really strongly held uh, positions, um, trainings are, are, are not as effective in, in breaking down those very strongly held personal beliefs. Mm -hmm. um, so one thing that I, I think we're, we're, we're tempting to do, and I'm responding to the first question, is that we have to be very open and public about the organization. And, and as George said, it's not just a mission statement type of thing. You actually have to, you have to live by it. Yeah. And so what, at least what the, the Massachusetts trial court is doing is really begin to think about how do we put as much of our information out there as possible? How do we begin to uh, be more transparent with um, where we are as, a, as an institution? And uh, the late Chief Justice Gantz um, wanted to do just that. And so he, he asked for the Harvard Law School to uh, to conduct a study on looking at sentencing in Massachusetts. Mm. And, and it was published last September. And what it showed was that there was still a significant um, difference between um, white, black, and Latino um, uh, people in the study and, mm. and the sentencing rates. So uh, I believe it was, and I, I'm not going to say these, these numbers correctly, but um, Black defendants were 7.9 times more likely to have a harsher sentence than white defendants. And I believe uh, Hispanic, Latinx was about 4.9 times that of whites. Mm -hmm. And so what it shows is, although we're really trying to do this, it's still, um, it's still a real issue that needs to be addressed. And yeah. so uh, I think the court in trying to be public about it, we yep. were holding community engagement sessions all around the state to say, this is where we are. We want to hear you. from you. We want to be able to learn from you. And then what we're doing after these community engagement sessions is we're meeting and we're talking about, okay, so what did we hear? And mm -hmm. how can we make these amendments and changes? And so uh, I think the biggest part is, is, is one, being transparent, but not just in terms of your mission statement. You have to be transparent about everything that you're trying to do. And I think that will help people have a, a greater clarity as to whether that's the type of place that they want to, to be an employee of. Yeah. George, I'll open it up, uh -huh. up to you for your thoughts, yeah. Just to, to expand on that a bit too, yeah. I think that your trainings and those things can be very good. I think that a lot of times institutions, for example, have their sort of feel good activities or that you know, they bring people together and um, and everyone leaves with a smile and 
So sometimes we go right back to our offices and you kind of forget about that. Mm. I think that where we're at a point now, we're saying for places and making this change is that sometimes organizations or institutions may have to change some of their traditions mm-hmm. and, and to acknowledge that, you know, it's to look at things, okay, what are we doing? You know, is there, a, is diversity represented here? Mm-hmm. Are we being inclusive for people here? Is it, it could be something that a way of doing things that in a sense puts certain groups at a disadvantage. And that could be men or women or, you know, people with families and things where they may be disadvantaged. You know, if only, if all the great training in, in your uh, workplace takes place after 7 p.m., mm-hmm. which sometimes is the case is where the, the best mentoring, the one-on-one things, you know, how can you work around that? Mm-hmm. And, and especially for, uh, in, in, as you're trying to achieve diversity and in diverse candidates, making a place welcoming and something that's sustainable because mm. it's it's really as as the as the world is changing it is it's not going to be only a power structure of only white men running things and, and so to really look to that how is it that we're going to have to adapt you know you have mm. to be um the new traditions in a sense yes Yes. Well, and I, I know now we've got questions coming in fast and furious. So thank you, everyone. Um, one question that seems to dovetail off of this very nicely, you know, when trying to figure out how, and this for the, the topic of the talk, how to move beyond these structured trainings in order to, to make this work continue and to make an impact. Um, someone asked about what's the importance of having a mentor or a sponsor to help advance traditionally underrepresented groups in an organization? Have either of you experienced that or seen that work either at this organization or at another one that you might've worked at? George, I'll pass it over to you. I was gonna say, this is one of the mentoring is one of the areas that I definitely have done a lot of research in around. And, and how, but the one thing is that mentoring is quite valuable uh, in terms of helping people to uh, adapt or be socialized to a field. But the one thing to keep in mind is that there are different types of mentoring. Uh, you know, there are mentorings where, where there is that sort of shepherding along mm-hmm. and really where someone is guiding you one sentence at a time, as I like to think about it, as you're writing something and, and every step along the way you know, for, for a time. And in a sense that uh, you're gonna turn around and hopefully that that person will do the same for others. Uh, that's quite valuable. But then there's, I think organizations and fields have to look at what types of mentoring they are engaging in. Is mm-hmm. it an individual mentoring? Is it a group mentoring? Is it sort of a neglectful mentoring, letting people figure mm-hmm. it out on their own mm-hmm. and, and what might work and what might not. But just as we talk about people doing you know, mentoring, having mentoring efforts, you know, mentoring is something you have to learn how to do, you have to learn how to be a mentor and how to be a mentee in a sense. And, mm-hmm. you know, and there are lots of trainings and things that are out there that, um, that talk to the, that speak to these issues, so. I, I would, I'd like to add that there, there, there's a lot of growing research about same race mentors and mentees and, and um, mixed race type of dynamics with, with um, that relationship. And one of the things that always resonates with me is that if, if you were same race or same gender, there are some unspoken understandings mm-hmm. that are often missed when you have uh, you know, an intersex or interracial partnership. And so I'm not saying that one is better than the other. Mm-hmm. What I'm saying is that there, there are the part of the mentorship uh, and there, there are a lot of different words coming out now talking about what's the difference between a, you know, a leader, a mentor, you know, all these various um, definitions. And, and what I find to, to be most important for me is a mentor is somebody who's actively committed. It's an active process mm. and, and not passive. So uh, I tried to establish one um, at, at a previous employer. We're actually doing it now with the trial court um, it's, it's an active process because we understand its value and we think that it will help people understand that there are pathways to career advancement. There are pathways to making sense 
of an environment that just seems so confusing and difficult to navigate, particularly for a justice system. And so um, having that, that, that mentorship role is, is absolutely important for aiding people and one, understanding how to navigate building social capital. Um, and, the, and then importantly, being able to, to have self-confidence mm -hmm. and, and understanding that, that you do have the capacities to succeed. Mm -hmm. You don't have to leave your organization, that you can stay, and there are ways to do that. And so I think there are a lot of those positive, affective things that those types of relationships are really important for. And we know that it typically hasn't really been offered to um, women and people of color. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's a lot of efforts now to, to begin to do that. Yeah, I know I'm just in some of the different podcasts I, I listen to. There's a lot talked about mentorship and sponsorship specifically too, about really giving someone the recognition and, an, and a chance to really to, to show that they're very capable of of holding that, that position, of doing the work. Um, you know, th that it speaks to a question that came in from registration uh, where someone asked, how do you deal with the slow pace of change? And I think mentorship, you know, all of this, it's really you're making small incremental changes, but how do you deal with that slow pace of change? And people saying they, you know, I agree, this is important, but you know, we gotta, we gotta take care of this first, or we've gotta really focus our efforts on this. and. How can, how have you seen, or could people help to center race as, like you said, George, making that commitment as something that is just as important as meeting your, say, quarterly goals or whatever it might be that you're working, working toward from that kind of business perspective? I think a lot of that, not only the commitment, but it's something you have to continually reevaluate. Yep. Because it, it, you know, change is slow, definitely. And especially, you know, of course, organizations have been around for a hundred years and, and, and have been successful that it is, you know, their models change little by little with the times. But I think that is, that's one of those things if you're cost continually reevaluating and changing, you know, and that the um, making adjustments, you know, and, and sometimes they may be more radical than others and what you have to do in, in exploring um, you know, if it's from a from different racial perspectives and different groups that you have to be um, more cognizant of in your own in your field or in your the employees who you're bringing in, what's changing? I think it's always something that's what's changing in your own community, because mm -hmm. you know so many of our cities are becoming much more racially and ethnically diverse. Um, you know, our, our big cities and you know, a lot of you know, in, in around the Washington D.C. area and you know, in Boston now too. There's just a lot of different immigrant groups who have, have moved in in the last two, two to three decades. And, you know, and their kids are now, have, have grown up here and they're adults. So now there's, there's a different experience. There's, you know, there's a, there's, there's, it's a different time, different group to speak to. So to, to really constantly reevaluate how you're doing what you do successfully, what you do mm -hmm. right. I think George is, is almost always right. So I'm gonna, I, George, George is right. And I'm gonna say, um, ch yeah, change is slow. Yeah. Meaningful change and transformational change is even slower. Yeah, and so uh, I think we I think we have to understand that, and and we have folks who are truly committed. They want to make change, and they're ready to go. And then yeah. bureaucracy, red tape, um, silos, you name it, right? Yeah. And so. Uh, eventually they feel less empowered, less capable, and then, you know, you, you lose this great talent. Yep. And so uh, one of the things that, that we've been really trying to, to make clear is that, and we're obviously a public system, so it's a justice system, it's a so there are unions and there are, uh, you know, a number of additional variables that a, a private entity may not have to encounter or, or, or respond to, mm. but we have, uh, we're, we're actively trying to reach out to every single uh, trial court employee. So we have about almost 6,500 trial court employees and we're, we're, we're creating ways in which um, either through trainings or other types of engagement, 
we're trying to, at the end, we're saying, and if you're interested in being part of this change, let us know and bringing them in. And so we're actually beginning to um, create a large list of, of, of employees who mm. really want to be committed to this change. And we're going to begin to start aligning some of those things and in, in those pieces. The, the challenge for us is that, um, and I think for many organizations, particularly for private, you're not compensated for this work. And so if, you, if you're a woman or you know, you're black or brown, they look at you like, hey, could, could you do this for me and, and help lead this committee? Yeah. Could, could you help with this discussion? And so there's these, all these types of unpaid labor yeah. that in the law uh, profession, um, law firms are now actually beginning to uh, compensate people yeah. for um, beginning to do this work because this work had to happen anyways and they weren't being paid for. They weren't being yeah. compensated. So I think it's a shift and people have to begin to recognize that. And, and, and I think that's one of those things that helps people understand that they can be part of a change process, yeah. but ultimately still is going to take a very long time. But that, those are ways to, to, to get people in there so they don't get burnt out so quickly. Yes. Uh, can I add to that? I, I yes, think please. too that in professions, I, I, I'm going to think about the, um, the academic areas where you have to value diversity that, mm -hmm. that has to be something that is and and being a mentor or a sponsor that, that that has to be valued by the field either if it's for someone who's being compensated for it financially or if it's a uh, part of the, someone a, a faculty member going up for tenure or mm. for full professorships or or anything as so you're evaluating their you know, their resume that these are things that are um, that have a, a importance and value. And even if that position is something that's seeing as, uh, you know, if it is that diversity officer and those things, that those positions have value. And, yeah. and, and, and they're signaling that this is someone that's doing something that is substantive and making a significant contribution in these roles. Well, and jumping off of the, the topic of conversation and, and of, you know, whether it's Paid or unpaid, um, it sounds like it's valued, which is good. Um, but someone asks a question, how do you cultivate discussions and create spaces for topics of DEI when there is no opportunity to have these types of conversations in the workplace? They ask, how do you keep an ongoing dialogue that's both, both effective and impactful? And they said, thank you. That, that can be hard to be also, you know, when talking about exhausting, to be the only person who keeps speaking up and saying, but we need to talk about this. We need to bring this forward. We need to center this. Um, what, what advice comes to mind? I'll open it up to whoever wants to jump in first. George, you like to go? I, you know, I, I have one, one, just one thought that came to mind. Maybe yeah. and, and I'll, 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 I'll yield to you, Isaac. Perhaps somehow that you're formalizing a position or, or someone that is going to bring up this diversity conversation. And it's not just, just something that's integrated. If it is in a, in a hiring situation that there is mm. someone that's always gonna be that, that uh, has to be the voice that's designated. This is the voice of diversity in my role. So let's say whatever we, you know, what do we, we have to think about this and put this on the table or yeah. in, making any, in making decisions. I think if it's formalized, it helps in a sense so that it's not some of the, to, it will limit some of that fatigue. Mm -hmm. and, and it doesn't mean that the diverse person uh, or my, yeah. a racial or ethnic minority has to be the one right. to say these things. It could, it, could, it, could be any, it could be any other professional. Right. I, I would add, if, if you are in a management position mm -hmm. and you have the ability to, or you're not in management, but you have the ability to influence like you, your, your staff meeting agenda items, put it on the agenda item one week, Put it on the agenda item again for week two. Put it on the agenda item for week three, and continue to do that. So you're you're demonstrating that your team, your department, your division understands that by grappling with these issues, your products and services will be better. Mm. I think that's very clear. The research is very clear on this. So if you're in a position to influence do it. 
Mm. If, if you are not in a position where you can influence agenda items or be able to go to your vice president, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I did something that was, was tricky and effective. Um, I, I think it, it, it didn't yield too much of a backlash. But uh, when I was earlier in my career, I, 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 I positioned my, my attempt to influence a agenda item by talking about strategic plan and aligning um, departmental um, activities with this particular piece of a strategic plan. And, I, and I, I had an idea and I wanted to discuss it. And that just opened the door for me to get in. And once I was in, I said, look folks, we gotta, we gotta have a different conversation because if our employees are feeling this way, that means they're gonna be uh, you know, less committed. They're gonna be checking out uh, they're going to be um, less um, uh, exploratory in their thinking. It's going to impact problem solving. So we actually have to uh, address these issues if we want to achieve our strategic plan, our expectations to provide the types of products and services that we say we're doing and that we're pursuing. And, and so um, tying it that way in that one attempt, um, really one, help people to kind of rethink um, what we were doing at that time. But two, it helped people see me differently. Mm. So I'm always the youngest in any room I'm in, always the youngest. And that's because, I think because, one, I'm, I'm willing to, to, to find ways to get there, to do it. And yeah. sometimes you just gotta be creative and structuring your questions to just be able to open the door and possibly even get a seat at the table. That's great. Well, and, you know, as we think about how we can try and change this organizational and workplace culture, what comes to mind if you can think of, say, two to three top factors that are essential to helping to, to start or sustain culture change within an organization? What comes to mind for people on the call who are leaving thinking, okay, what, what are, if I'm going to pick say one or two things that I'm gonna do after this call, what from your perspective would be the most impactful to start right away? Good question. Uh, you know, I, I think of a couple things. The, the, the first is really easy. Uh, my high school uh, out in California, um, my, my high school mentor, Reverend Steve Pinkston, he, at the end of every email, and oftentimes our many conversations, I was not really good at math, so he was a math teacher, so we spent a lot of time together. Um, he said these two words, and these two words continue to resonate for me today, and oftentimes I will say these two words to others, and that is press on. Mm. You know, what he's talking about is perseverance, and um, then Mr. Pinkston um, who, who was uh, a math teacher who helped to talk, to teach about perseverance, helped me get over my math phobia. And he was a true asset to my life. And, and those, that, those two words, press on, mm. really speaks to the need for us to just sustain ourselves, find ways to, to, to feel enriched, to, you know, when you're knocked down, you get back up. Might not be quickly, but you get back up and, and you're able to continue. And I think, you know, perseverance for me is, is, is really huge um, in, in that regard. And then and the last piece is, you know, this is my calling. I truly believe God put me here to do this work. Mm. And so it would be contradicting my own understanding of my faith and the role that I, I fulfill in, in my place of employment, if I gave up, mm -hmm. I can't give up. And so um, I think for, for many people, it's just finding what is your purpose? Yeah. And if you really understand your purpose and you understand the, the ideas of perseverance, I think those, those two are powerful components to that question. That's great, thank you. 
Well, that's hard, a idea. tough act to follow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think well, perseverance definitely is something to, uh, you know, that is definitely needed in, in this. And I always say commitment more so than anything too. Uh, I think also it's acknowledging that, you know what, there, there are some shortcomings. There's some things that need to be improved and enhanced around these three areas around race and, and uh, equity and, and, inclus and inclusion. That there, there is a need for change, even no matter how um, you know much we think we have it right, we, don't, we often don't. Yeah. <laughs> and, and it will always need to be something. Probably, I think that's anything this last year has taught us. Sometimes these are things that are always going to need to be probably examined and re-examined and tweaked and, and changed. It's not going to be just you know it, you, you can't just pass a piece of legislation or something or admit a a, a class of, with, that has. 10% minority students and think it's over now. We've got it. Right. Yeah, because there's, there's a lot more that's needed. Right. No, thank you. Well, I know that we're, we're wrapping up time and I know there are tons of questions that we unfortunately weren't able to get to from registration and from the, the Q&A. So thank you everyone for all of these great, great questions and this great engagement. My last question for both of you is more thinking about resources. So, you know, outside of structured trainings, I know that there are tons of great books and podcasts and movies, and there's so much out there that people can consume to educate themselves around diversity, equity, and inclusion. So for each of you, what comes to mind as your favorite resources that people should check out in order to help keep them going and, and fill them up while they're doing this work? George, you want, you, you want to start? Wow, this is, this is something, one of the things that I, I try to do is really look at, see what's going on in specific communities. I, mm -hmm. I, I'll, I'll read things like um, diversity in higher education, for example, saying just what, what's happening. What are, the, what are the experts in the field saying? What are, who are they recognizing and things? And I, and I think for a lot of us, no, we're not gonna pick up a, um, you know, an academic journal, but you will, maybe you'll pick up a, a periodical like that or, or, and, and, or going to their website to see, mm. to see what's important. That's great. I, uh, I agree. So, you know, as a, someone who's gone through a, a graduate program training you to think in one way, I, I, I do first gravitate towards journals. Um, but um, where I draw a lot of inspiration are from the types of books where they share stories. Mm. And, you know, I, I used to teach a, a first year seminar um, and I used uh, the book, The Color of Water by James McBride. Mm. And what a fascinating text that he offers and, and, and allows for the exploration of a number of topics. Mm. And every semester that I taught that book, uh, or that I used that book in, in that class, the, the, the journey, you can see other people's journeys. And, and, and part of their homework was to kind of talk about those journeys. And, and so I really draw myself towards those texts because oftentimes there are so many lessons inside these personal stories that they're sharing that if we're able to identify those lessons, we're gonna be able to take something back with us personally, not just to reflect, but be able to do. And so, um, you know, I, I was a philosophy major at Holy Cross, so, um, you might, I don't know if you can see in the back of my, my you know, but I got like a, a Plato, my, my Plato book is right here where my thumb is. <laughs> and so one of the things you learn as a philosophy major is to be able to, to, you're trained to read and think a little bit differently about what are various perspectives in this, in this position, in this argument. And so um, I think I carry that with me when I read books, when I, when I read journals. And so for me, it's reading other books that, that really offer that, that, that place for me to have a journey so I, I'm better prepared. Wonderful. Wonderful. Thank you both so much. I'm going to pass it over to Erica. I know she has a few last remarks, but I want to thank you both, George and Isaac. This has been really tremendous. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So it's been a pleasure. I, I feel honored to be here today. This has been great. So... Thank you, everyone. I just have like a very quick remark. So I just wanted to reiterate my thanks to Maura, thank our panelists, George and Isaac for their time this afternoon and sharing us their experience, advice and suggestions to keep centering diversity, equity, inclusion work, wherever you may find yourself in the workforce. And like the main takeaway that I want people to take away from this webinar is that um, all of us have agency 
and that you're not alone in doing this work. And as um, Isaac had said, we have to continue to press on. So if that means going out and looking for mentors or speaking with different colleagues, I mean, we're all available here. This is why we're doing this webinar. So we want to make sure that you guys aren't alone. Um, again, I want to thank our audience members who are here and joining us today. And, and I will be sending a post email with regards to the recording a post survey. So I know there are a couple of different um, interests that people have had that popped in the questions um, Q&A section. So I'll have that available. And as well as some like um, resources where you can continue these conversations and kind of just in, be more involved. So thank you, everyone, and have a great afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you all.